Hello there. Uh, some time ago I made a video in which I demonstrated uh, one of the Michael de la Maza's uh, board vision drills uh, with uh, a real board and piece and uh, fork and skewers and, and so on. And uh, I will continue to record videos uh, regarding uh, the la Maza method. But uh, in that video I promised you that I will do one day a review of a famous Michael de la Maza book. And it's called uh, Rapid Chess Improvement, a study plan for adult players. And, uh, well, actually, this book uh, arrived, this is the book, and uh, it arrived only today. I, I've purchased it and, uh, well, I wanted to have it in my library, although the, his method is described in uh, these articles of his uh, from the year 2001 in uh, Chess Horizons. I will link these out, uh, articles uh, down link in the description of the video so you can check them out. And, uh, well, I heard that the book doesn't contain uh, much uh, more information than uh, these articles, but uh, well, nevertheless, I wanted to have this book and uh, well, I have to say it arrived just uh, this morning and uh, I already read this book uh, from cover to cover. It's not a big book, it's uh, 100 and something 20 pages. It has some annotated games in it uh, and a uh, little more detailed description of the method and also some uh, reviews uh, from the people who actually tried the method and uh, improve the, their chess. So, uh, well, just a few words if you didn't hear about uh, Michael de la Maza. He is, well, by now a controversial chess figure. Uh, he's an adult uh, improver and uh, he started uh, to play chess uh, well, as, a, as an adult and he had uh, some uh, 1300 rating. I'm talking about US rating, but uh, okay, just for the reference. So he had some 1300 rating uh, in when he was 30 years old and then he decided to uh, try some other method he tried many uh, conventional methods uh, read many books on, on strategy books like uh, Silman Kotov and Padolfini and so on he even hired some coaches he did lots of opening studies and game studies but uh, he just couldn't improve so he stick to 1300 1400 uh, strength well and then he decided that uh, he had enough and uh, that he wants to try some other method and to radically revise uh, the way adults uh, should be taught uh, chess and how adults uh, should improve in chess. So he devised his uh, famous method and then he wrote first. Uh, and uh, well, but the most important thing is that he applied this method first on himself and he did achieve a, a high, very high rated rating. So here is the diagram. You can see that this is his, uh, his rating. I hope you can, you can see this on the camera. So he started with uh, 1300 and he ended up with uh, just above 2000 and he even won uh, the under 2000 uh, tournament on uh, World Open and won uh, the price of 10,000 uh, 10, uh, US dollars. So uh, this uh, improvement from 1300 to 2000 was in uh, less than two years. So uh, th this is very, of course, uh, I mean, th just just take a look of this diagram. This is very, very impressive. And this is only in the course of uh, two years. And uh, then after he uh, after he achieved this uh, success, he published these articles in the Chess Horizons. And uh, well, the most curious thing, he stopped playing chess. So he, he reached his goal. Uh, he became an uh, expert player uh, with uh, above 2000 uh, rating. And then uh, he just... Uh, said, okay, I proved my point, uh, it's possible to greatly improve as an adult, and now I have better things to do, I will not play chess anymore. And uh, there is even an anecdote uh, said by Dan Heisman, in which uh, Dan Heisman met De La Maza and he asked uh, ask him, why, why did you stop playing chess? And he says, that, well, I, I know that uh, for master level, I should take some very, very serious chess studies, and I don't have uh, time and will for, the, for this, I just wanted to, to prove my point. So. Hence the controversy. And uh, also, well, his book and his method was uh, criticized by great chess authors. So you can uh, find online, maybe I will link this uh, article if I, if I find it. Um, uh, Jeremy Silman, uh, he, he did review of this book and he was very, uh, well, he, he was not very uh, kind to, to De La Maza. He even accused him of selling snake oil. Uh, for his method, I, I don't know why, because maybe, well, De La Maza criticized Silman, Silman's approach uh, in this book, so well, Silman probably 
uh, replied in that manner. Although if you read this book uh, like, like I did today, uh, he actually speaks very highly of Silman and he uh, uh, cites uh, Silman's amateur's mind uh, many times as, as a positive, um, in, in a positive uh, tone. And also he's, he's talking about his Reassess Your Chess and he says that uh, Yes, by all means, you should read uh, Silman's Reassess Your Chess, but only once you stop uh, blundering pieces uh, and miss uh, two, two and three move tactics. So I, I don't know why this negative comment uh, by International Master Silman, but okay, it's there. And also, if you look at the uh, book by uh, John Nunn, English, uh, I think he's a grandmaster, uh, in his book, uh, Practical Secrets for Club Players or something like that, his famous book, uh, he uh, also criticizes uh, uh, De La Maza, he makes a short book review and, uh, well, I, I don't know why he also says that uh, this uh, his method is not very uh, good and uh, that it's, it's just uh, overestimated for some reason. Uh, I, I don't share the, these uh, sentiments, I think it's, uh, this book is very interesting, it's very challenging, uh, his method is very promising and uh, many, many people use this method and improve their chess, their chess uh, Michael Delamaza being uh, the first one. And uh, also in his favor, I have to say that his method is actually still uh, still living. So after uh, this, uh, Michael Delamaza wrote these, these articles, uh, soon afterwards this famous Woodpecker method arrived, which basically follows his example. So Woodpecker method is just uh, uh, Michael Delamaza's seven circle method, but okay, just arranged a little bit different. And also, uh, well, uh, even later on, when uh, Chessable was uh, um, brought up, uh, they adopted this uh, repetition idea that you should solve the same puzzles over and over again, and they improved it by uh, introducing this uh, spaced uh, repetition feature on Chessable, which is also kind of evolved uh, the Lamaza method. So I think that, uh, well, these negative comments uh, are, are not... Uh, are not in place since this method is uh, still up and living and running and recommended by uh, many, many different chess players. Okay, so I'll be talking about uh, the method and uh, I didn't say what the method is, but I think you, you probably know already, especially if you watch my early, early videos. But let me let me just go through the, through the book. I, it's, well, it, it's a very interesting book. It's, uh, it's fun to read. So, uh, in, in her, first in the in the foreword, uh, so in the very beginning, he uh, he tells you what is his method about, and it has three steps. So first step is improve your chess vision, second one is increase your tactical ability, and third one is learn how to think over the board. So uh, well, the first improve your chess vision. Uh, this is regarding this uh, chess vision uh, drills. I, I made a video about and I will may make a few more videos about. So uh, just to get familiar, familiarized with uh, the chessboard. And then uh, increase your tactical ability. Uh, uh, how to increase tactical ability? Well, Dalamaza says uh, take 1000 uh, puzzles. Uh, he recommends CT Art. It's uh, 2002, so, uh, so not much online resources were available uh, back then. And uh, so the point is take 100 puzzles and solve them over and over again. He recommends in several circles. So uh, solve them uh, seven times over, each time a half uh, the faster than the previous time. So you, you should uh, spend, uh, I don't know what is his number, but uh, let's say uh, 120 days for the first cycle, then 60 days for the second circle, then 30 days for the third circle and so on. And the, and the end, uh, the seventh circle, is that you solve all uh, thousand puzzles in just one day. And then you, you, you completed uh, your uh, seven circles, and uh, uh, this means that the patterns presented in these uh, tactics uh, should be uh, somehow carved into your brain uh, that is stored in your uh, long-term uh, memory, and then you'll be tactically very, very strong. Well, like I said, there are some controversial points in the book, and uh, well, this is why uh, some authors don't like him. Uh, for example, he says that if you are above uh, 2000, just completely forget about openings, forget about strategy, forget about uh, end games. You can all pick that up uh, well, here and there, and you should uh, work on your tactics. So if you are strong in tactics, then it doesn't matter uh, if you are weak in openings, because the openings uh, give you just slight advantage or disadvantage, and uh, tactical blunder. 
uh, gives you a huge advantage or uh, disadvantage uh, depending from which side you are uh, watching this. And uh, also he says, uh, well, the end games are nothing more than uh, calculations and they are based on on tactics or, or, or calculation of or board vision. So if you have good board vision, if you have good uh, board skills, and uh, if you have uh, good tactical skills, well, most likely you will, you will never even reach the end game because you will win material before the end game. So if you go to, to the end game, you will be two points up or, or a piece up and, uh, well, and then you don't need uh, much skill. And uh, well, if you know your tactics, you will know to apply the tactics in the in the end game. So these are just uh, some of uh, his his remarks. And uh, well, maybe this is why uh, so some of the authors uh, who base their uh, books and their approach on uh, strat strategy and positional game maybe dislike him uh, for that. Well, he offers several insights in the introduction. So the first insight is that uh, chess knowledge is not the same as chess ability. If you see at my last video, this, this was the title of my video, and uh, I, I didn't know that it was in this book. My video is titled uh, Too Much Knowledge, Too Little Skill. And he says that, that uh, in the, his first insight. So he says that uh, chess knowledge is not the same as chess ability. And he says, okay, if you read uh, lots of strategy books, uh, you can read, read lots of uh, positional books. You can know all your theory about open files, south post, uh, open diagonals, minority attack, all, all these strategical elements. And you can also know um, you have the encyclopedia of opening in your in your head. Uh, this still doesn't uh, mean anything if your tactical skills are bad, because you will only be uh, strong uh, some 13, 14, uh, 100 if if you don't know uh, tactics, if you don't have tact tactical skill uh, to know uh, how to uh, exploit this advantage you get either from the opening or from the superior position. So this is a uh, one uh, one one insight and. Uh, he, he makes here a very interesting uh, experiment. Uh, so he was creating uh, engine personalities. You know, there, there are some programs like this old Chess Master uh, 9000 or I, I don't know, there are probably more programs which allow you to um, make your own engine personality. So you can uh, boost his, you have some parameters and then you can say, okay, I want this engine to be excellent at opening, excellent repositional play and so-so in tactics or, or something like this. And uh, Dalamaza did uh, did this, and uh, he created two personalities, uh, one without any positional knowledge, so no opening book, no understanding of pawn st structure, no, but with maximum tactical knowledge. And he let him play against uh, the other engine with maximum positional knowledge, maximum opening knowledge, but uh, very poor tactical knowledge. And you can guess the tactical engine uh, won the game. And uh, where the, there is also another parameter in this uh, engine personalities, you can uh, tell him how many moves do you want uh, you want him to uh, look ahead and uh, he made uh, an experiment and he made one engine who could see two moves ahead and he has all the positional and opening knowledge uh, uh, which he can have and uh, the other one uh, which has no positional knowledge but can see three moves ahead and the one who could see three moves ahead uh, win so uh, he says this is a key lesson all of the positional knowledge in the world is worth less than the ability to see one move ahead. In other words, given the choice between being able to see five moves ahead in every position and having no positional knowledge and being able to see four moves ahead in every position and having a GM's positional knowledge, you should choose the former. So he says that if you can see one move ahead, it's worth more than all the books in the world. And okay, it, it, it is controversial, but it's hard to argue against that, uh, especially when you do this uh, angel personalities experiment. Uh, insight number two, he says that uh, GM instruction is suboptimal at the class level. I was also talking about this when I was introducing my Patreon uh, site, and uh, he's, he gives uh, the, the same example I did. I, I didn't know about his example. So he says that uh, some university professor in mathematics will not be able to uh, teach a first grader uh, the, the, the basic of mathematics as well as uh, some school teacher, although this university professor with PhD in mathematics is a much better mathematician. So he says uh, something I noticed also, that uh, GMs and the very strong players who started uh, the game as, uh, as kids, well, they, they have very difficult time to understand that uh, adult players just, just don't see some things which they do. And then they give you advice like uh, you should uh, increase your positional understanding, you should work on your openings, uh, you should uh, work on endgame studies or, or something like this because they're not even aware of what does it mean to 
not see that uh, your piece is attacked or that you move your queen on the square which is controlled by the knight and you, you just lose uh, lose the queen uh, so uh, he advises that you should uh, if you are lower rated you should uh, learn chess from a lower rated player but who are uh, who knows uh, who know the method and especially the players uh, who started as adults like michael de la Maza himself who started as adults uh, who and who achieved uh, a serious improvement as as adults and he says uh, okay uh, you have famous instructors you have bruce pandolfini who is uh, known uh, to work with uh, young young students so so with kids and you have someone like mark dvoretsky who is known uh, for his ability to make uh, gms out of ims but uh, well <laughs> if you are 35 years old and uh, you're stuck you are 1300 there, there are not many instructors who can uh, instruct you, who, who can understand what are you going through. And this is why he says that, uh, well, hiring uh, ho coaches, uh, high-rated coaches uh, who are masters is not uh, fruitful. It, it will not uh, help you. And uh, insight number three is uh, what I was al already talking about, Quick Vix's work at the class level. So uh, he just says that uh, it is a myth that... Uh, you need some deep theoretical knowledge uh, in order to come to the expert level, so uh, above 2000. And, uh, well, it, it just doesn't doesn't make any sense to read uh, books like uh, The Art of the Middle Game by Keres, although uh, this book can be very enjoyable and very, uh, very fun to read, but uh, it, it will not improve you. You don't need any deep theoretical knowledge. You just need to stop blundering, uh, stop giving away your pieces and stop missing uh, two or three move tactics and this is enough already to bring you great improvement he's also talking about uh, the mythology of chess mastery so what, what does it mean to be chess master do you really have to to have the encyclopedia of chess knowledge in your head he says of course not and and so on so these are some uh, things in the, in the introduction i will not read the whole book here it doesn't make any sense and uh, after each uh, chapter, he gives a summary of the chapter. So this uh, introduction to the chapter, well, he says that uh, most uh, of the games, if you can analyze your own games or any games or, uh, of submaster level, and um, you, you'll always see that uh, the game is decided by some uh, missed tactics or, or gross blunder. So it's not the same in, in if you are... Uh, Grandmaster or international master or even national master. Then, when you analyze the game with the engine, uh, this this graph you you have you, you get as a result. For example, on on leeches, uh, then you can see that uh, there are slight advantages on one side, slight on the other side, and it, it's pretty much equal uh, all the game. Then then someone does something to improve his position, and then uh, the game goes in his favor. But when you look at these uh, lower rated uh, games and uh, Maybe you, you can look, if you are lower rated like me, you can just uh, uh, analyze your own games with the engine and you will see that uh, diagram, well, it, it looks like this. It, it just has many ups and downs because uh, every now and then someone misses some opportunity or, or blunders. And here he also mentions, uh, quotes uh, Simon, the amateur's mind, and he says, uh, well, look at the games in the amateur's mind and in every game uh, the lower rated player uh, makes a blunder uh, sooner or later. Okay. Uh, so, in the first chapter, he is talking about chess vision drills. Those are the drills I have uh, shown you in my previous video, and I will show you more. So, to practice uh, just on the empty board uh, with a minimal number of pieces, skewers, forks, and uh, knight movements. And he also he gives some uh, optional chess, and, uh, chess vision drills. So, uh, some drills which are not mentioned uh, in the article. So, in the original article, he mentions only the, these two. Uh, drills, so uh, skewers, forks, and then a knight moves. And uh, here he uh, mentions some additional optional uh, drills which you can uh, apply if you want. So this is it. And the chapter two, so the, the most important is uh, famous uh, seven circles. And uh, I have already uh, told you about this in the introduction of this video. So if you take 100 tactical problems, solve them over and over again in uh, seven circles, so you can solve them uh, seven times. Uh, seventh time you should solve them all in one day, and then your uh, pattern recognition and your technical skill will improve greatly. And then he talks about this uh, City Art uh, 3.0, and he gives many screenshots about how this program should be used. And he was also criticized for that. He said, uh, they said, okay, he didn't know how to, uh, how to fill the pages, so he just uh, put some screenshots. But, uh, well, bear in mind, this is 2002, and uh, 
well, uh, the computer literacy at that time was not like today and there were not so many online resources. Uh, so to give detailed explanation how to use a software is not uh, is actually useful. It, it was useful. Maybe, maybe today, no, not because everybody knows how to use uh, computers and software, but uh, in these days, it, it I, I can see it makes sense. And then, uh, well, besides this uh, City Art uh, 3.0, he also gives recommendation of um, some other software and uh, some other books, um, which, which are good. And he says what are good sites and bad sites and so on. And uh, what is interesting to me is that uh, on this list, uh, there is uh, my favorite uh, um, book on tactics, uh, Laszlo Polgar, Chess, uh, 5,334 Problems, Combinations and Games. I uh, I was talking about this book in one of my last videos. Uh, I, I did uh, an almost full review of this book, so I'll just link it below. And he says that, uh, well, this is an excellent book. And he said that uh, you can just select uh, 1,000 uh, problems, uh, 1,000, uh, any uh, two or three move combinations, and you can do your seven circles using the Polgar book. It's, it's very interesting. And he says also the, for Polgar book, uh, he very highly praises it. He says that if you're not quite sure of your ability or, or want to have a book that will grow with you, this is the book to buy. So if you need to buy only one book and you don't know your ability, you're not sure and you want a book uh, which uh, will stick you for the, for the rest of your life, then uh, buy, buy Laszlo Pogar's book. And uh, you can see it's always here in the on my on my shelf. Okay, so what? Uh, okay, now he's talking about how to create a schedule, how much time to take per problem. So he says 10 minutes, 5 minutes to solve it, 5 minutes to check it. So there are some practical advices. I will not bother you with those. Okay, so we come to chapter 3 how to think. And uh, this is maybe the most controversial chapter because uh, I noticed that uh, the opinions of uh, the different players and coaches. Uh, largely differ about uh, this matter. So there are basically two camps uh, on, on this matter. Uh, one is uh, uh, the proponents of uh, having the good algorithm and uh, think during the game uh, following the algorithm. So uh, Michael de la is one, one of the, these proponents, obviously, because uh, I, I will tell you later about this chapter. And uh, well, this is also the, uh, the, the way which is advised by uh, Silman, uh, then Heisman and so on. So the idea is uh, to have some kind of to-do list. And uh, when you encounter the position where your, your opponent makes the move, then you apply uh, some kind of to-do list and uh, uh, in order to, to find a good move and in order to make blunder check, not, not to blunder um, material or, or, or checkmate. And, uh, well, on, on the other camp, uh, there are people who says that... Uh, well, this is ridiculous because nobody uh, thinks like that. If you talk with masters, with grandmasters, uh, and if you ask them, uh, what is your to-do list? Uh, how do you think over the board? He can just laugh at you because he said, well, there is no to-do list. I just look at the position. The moves go go in, in, in my head. I look at various combinations. Uh, I, I try on, on subconscious level uh, to, to remember uh, similar positions in the same games I have analyzed. And then I just uh, come up with a good move uh, with intuitively, and then I check uh, if this move works. I, I try to calculate several variations and so on. So this other camp says that uh, it doesn't make any sense to have a to-do list. And in fact, uh, I have this uh, argue with a club colleague of mine. He's much stronger player than I am. Uh, he's above uh, 2000. And he always laughs at, laughs at me when I uh, mention this uh, to-do list. And uh, well, he thinks it's just nonsense. You, could, you should just uh, look at, train yourself to look at the board and uh, see the best move, calculate uh, combinations, variations, and to find the best con continuation. And um, well, I have to say that I am more in the first camp. Uh, I think it does make sense, but not infinitely. So what, what do I mean by this? And this is also what Michael de la Maza is uh, saying in his book. So for example, when you start playing tennis and you take an instructor and you take the racket, you take the ball, and you start uh, hitting the ball off the wall. And then your uh, instructor could, could uh, tell you to uh, keep in mind several things when you are doing, for example, forehand. So uh, you want to have uh, your arm uh, parallel with the ground. You have to have 65% uh, of your weight on the front foot. Your wrist uh, should be fixed. It should be aligned with your uh, arm. Your elbow should be fixed uh, and several other things. You should think 
uh, when you want to perform uh, forehand correctly. And uh, of course, some uh, tennis player who is experienced tennis player uh, could look at these lessons and laugh and says, well, I play tennis all the time and I never think about uh, bringing 65% of my weight on the front foot. Well, of course he doesn't because he did forehand a million times and uh, he automated uh, this process and he doesn't have to think uh, to put his weight on the front foot uh, um, before forehand because uh, he, he just uh, does it, uh, his uh, muscle memory memorized that uh, he should do this and he, he does. But uh, when you train for the first time, then you have to think. So you hit the ball off the wall slowly and the, when the ball approaches, you have to think of these five or six elements uh, to have correct posture, correct uh, movement, to do uh, forehand as, as you should. And after you do this a million times, you will not have to uh, to think about it. It will just become automated process. So I think the same is in chess. So you should have some structured way of thinking until you automate it. Automate it. And, uh, and once you automate it, uh, then, well, you, you, you will not need to do a list because you will do this all in your head. Uh, so uh, the Lamaza has this approach and he says that you should uh, work on your uh, thinking algorithm uh, for at least uh, 200 games. And then after 200 games, and it should be slow games, of course, you should take your time and you should apply this algorithm before every move. And then after 200 games, you will automate this thinking process and you will not uh, have to go with to-do list. And then you can play after this uh, period, you can play a blitz games and rapid games and you will still implement this way of thinking because you will be trained uh, to do so. So what is his thinking algorithm? He has eight steps. You can check them out in the article. I just uh, uh, shortly uh, comment of them. So first uh, step is to make a physical movement because before the move. So this is something uh, j just just to get you into focus when you're at the tournament and then you wait uh, for a long time to, for your opponent to make the move. Everything, uh, everybody's walking around you and uh, lots of things are, are going on and then you should concentrate. So you should make some physical movement, uh, whatever, to to get yourself in this uh, state of thinking. So this is the first one, first step. Uh, second step is to look the board with chest vision. So short look of the, of the, of the board, uh, just to see if you can notice some obvious threats, uh, so some obvious geometrical features of the board, and this shouldn't last uh, long, maybe for 10 seconds. So just take a look on the board. Uh, then understand your opponent's threats. So look, uh, does your opponent have any threats with uh, this move? So does he have any... So now I, I'm talking uh, well, how would uh, Dan Heisman extend this uh, this step? Uh, he would say uh, check uh, for all the checks, captures and uh, threats with this move and especially see the all, all the things this move does. So not just uh, uh, obvious, obvious thing, okay, he's attacking... Uh, I, I don't know, peace, but on the other hand, he can also uh, uncover some discovered attack which uh, threatens checkmate, for example. So you should you should see all, all the threats. Uh, number four is write down the opponent's move on the score sheet. So this is when you are on the tournament. Uh, number five is uh, if your opponent has a serious threat, then respond. If not, calculate the tactical sequence. If no tactical sequence exists, implement a short plan. So this uh, number five is basically uh, choose the move. So if there is a threat, you have to address the threat. If there is no threat, then uh, look for uh, forcing moves yourself. So can I do any uh, checks, captures and threats? And uh, can I, uh, is there any tactical possibility which I can exploit? And if not, then just implement some short plan, like uh, he gives he, uh, the example, improve the mobility of the pieces, prevent the opponent from castling, trade off pawns if the position requires uh, keep the queens on the board uh, and so on. So you should just play some uh, logical move. Uh, number six is write down your move. So he's uh, here he's suggesting that you should write your move on the score before you make it. And according to the current uh, FIDA rules, uh, this is not allowed. So this was allowed back then when he was writing the book, but now it's not allowed. So you should first play then then write uh, the move. So this advice is not applicable. And uh, Number seven is the imagine the position after you make the intended move and then uh, make a short blunder check. So he says, uh, use your chess vision to check the position. So this is a blunder check or if you can do a more detailed blunder check that you should ask yourself, if I play this move, what are all the 
checks, captures, and threats my opponent has, and can I address uh, these these threats? So you could, should do some uh, blunder check, and then uh, number eight, uh, hit the clock. Okay, so these are the eight steps, and basically they can be uh, tied up to only, uh, I think, three uh, three main steps. So first, is look your op for your opponent's threats. Second, uh, look if you have any tactical opportunities uh, in the position, if not uh, play the logical move. And the number three, imagine your position after the uh, move and uh, make a blunder check. So these three are, are the basics and uh, those other are just uh, some practical things of the tournament. So in which point you should write down the move, make physical movement before and, and so on. So uh, this is his uh, proposed way of thinking. and. Uh, like I said, he uh, he says that you should uh, stick to this uh, algorithm on every move. So even if this is opening or end game or mate in one, or if you get checked, uh, so most of the time you, you get check, uh, checked and you have only one legal move. He says, nevertheless, you should apply this algorithm even if you have only one legal move in the position, because in this way you will discipline your way of thinking. And then he gives a sample game, so the game he played and he uh, discussed how he applied uh, this algorithm after every move, and this is very interesting. And I think I will make uh, I, I will make a video of this game and uh, and tell you how did he apply this algorithm after every move. It's an it's uh, an interesting game, and uh, later he analyzed this with an with an engine, and he says, okay, I had the advantage, then I lost the advantage, then I regained the advantage, and uh, eventually he he won the game. It was very interesting. And then in chapter four, he gives some uh, practical tactics. So he gives you some uh, problems. Uh, he says that uh, these problems uh, should serve you to see uh, where, where do you stand. And uh, these are the problems um, of the players who are uh, on the submaster level. Uh, they will play under tournament conditions. And uh, this is why he says that uh, you should not take more than uh, two minutes per, per sequence. I think this is very, very ambitious. But okay, so he gives some 42 exercises from this Undermaster game, so between 1200 and 1600 US CF, and then later from 1600 to uh, 2000. So okay, there are even some exercises in the book. Uh, in chapter 5 he talks about, uh, well, successes with rapid chess improvement, so after his articles were published, uh, some people adopted his method, and uh, they report, they, they wrote to him that... Uh, they have experienced uh, great improvement and uh, well the, the comments are very enthusiastic so they said yes it takes dedication it takes much effort it's not fun as uh, reading some uh, positional uh, book in, in which some uh, fine uh, fancy chess stuff are addressed but uh, it uh, brings brings improvement in the end so everybody agrees that the improvement is is there and on the chapter six uh, he says well how to move on, what to do next. He cites uh, international master Ignacio Marin. Uh, there are three three ways to constantly improve in chess. So the first thing is play as frequently as possible and against strong players. The second is analyze your games and the three is study tactics. So after this seven circle method, you should continue to study tactics uh, all the time. And you can select uh, maybe another 100 puzzles do the seven circles method or do or just do uh, any any tactical training but you should do the tactical training uh, all the time and there is also one interesting uh, thing in which he says how to uh, analyze your games let me just find this i think i i skipped this and this is very important because he says uh, here it is post-mortem in the chapter three so how to analyze your your game and uh, he says well uh, on on this level if you are uh, below uh, 2000 it doesn't make sense to uh, spend hours analyzing your games so what you should do you should run the engine and you should see the evaluation graph given by the engine so you know if you ever uh, used for example liches you, you know that after the game you have this uh, diagram in which you can see your ups and downs and then uh, concentrate on the points in which you uh, had an advantage and uh, suddenly lost the advantage and uh, then, then you can see uh, why and try to figure out why why is that what did you do wrong uh, to to lose uh, the advantage so for example he gives one uh, here one uh, one analysis so this is made by fritz okay now he says okay you should focus on this this point so here you had the advantage 
and then you suddenly lost the advantage. So at one point you you were 0 0.8, and, and and the other point, some 10 moves or 15 moves later, you uh, you had the disadvantage. So you should focus on uh, on this um, sequence of moves and try to figure out why did you lose the advantage. And uh, if you do, then they're great. Then you you uh, you learn something. And uh, he also says that. Uh, uh, in in this post mortem you can learn the openings so he calls this uh, just let me, let me see uh, I think w one move per game opening preparation it's uh, also interesting concept so he says don't uh, don't study openings don't don't uh, take opening book and uh, study openings so you just uh, play your games and after post mortem if uh, you can uh, see that uh, you you lost advantage in the opening stage uh, then look at the engine, look at the book, uh, like on Liches you have this uh, book, and then uh, see uh, what was the wrong move here and how could you improve um, your, your opening at that stage, and then uh, you learned uh, one move. So he says the one move game opening study program. So uh, after every game you will learn uh, one move in the opening. And if, if you play a uh, lot of games then you will uh, know have your opening repertoire without uh, reading books, or memorizing opening variations. Okay, well, uh, this video took some time, uh, but uh, well, I, I think for adult improvers, uh, this book is uh, really something you you you, sh you shouldn't miss. Uh, so may maybe you, you can have your own opinions. You don't have to agree uh, in every point with uh, De La Maza, but uh, the fact it is that De La Maza is the adult improver uh, we all want to be. So we all want to come from uh, 1300 to 2000 in two years. So I think that uh, reading the book uh, written by the man who actually did it is uh, very, very instructive. And uh, this is why I highly recommend uh, this book from uh, Michael de la Maza. Uh, thank you very much for uh, watching this video. I hope you find it useful. And uh, please, if you did, uh, click the like button, subscribe to my channel. If you didn't, uh, leave the comment below and uh, see you very soon with uh, more chess content. Cheers.